Uh, welcome to another Clear Mountain Monastery interview. Today we're so happy to have Venerable Chanda and Venerable Upeka. Um, welcome. It's great to have you. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah, actually, I, I would, I want to start with sort of your uh, last few maybe years of, of, or even just the last year of establishing the new Vihara, but actually I thought it'd be kind of fun to start with asking you each what one particularly powerful Dhamma teaching from the suttas has been that's really uh, echoed in your mind and heart these last few years or really continued to come up uh, some, something that's really been a thread uh, before starting anywhere else. Hmm. Do you want to start? Uh, well, the one that comes up straight away is the Anatta Lakana Sutta, <laughs> or the discourse on non-self. Rather, that's where my mind seems to uh, f seems to want to work at. Like uh, when I, yeah, the the the. How do you talk about non-self? <laughs> <laughs> and yet, it seems the most important thing. It seems to be the problem behind all the problems. So, you know, if you aren't looking at what is. Uh, driving your anger, what is driving your desires, then it feels like you're only just sort of, sort of, um, well, clearing away the dirt, constantly clearing away the dirt and never pulling out the root. So for me, the, the root is, is the self that thinks that it is in charge and somehow exists. Hmm even though I am not able to completely see through it, I turn my head in that way and, and look at where is this all coming from and remind myself of the teachings of the Buddha, of uh, there is, this is just all a creation, that something, that there is a me running the show. So I, I, I uh, that is my, that's where I turn my head, you could say. Yeah. That's wonderful. Venerable Chanda, what about you? Yeah, actually, I was going to say something similar, but I guess I could add a different nuance in that when I'm focused very much at the moment, obviously, on building community and creating community, I think the teaching of non-self helps inform that too, specifically around the way we're conditioned by our surroundings, by our company, by the people that we're around. And so I guess the theme of Kalyanamitta and why that is such um, a powerful and essential part of the path. So Kalyanamitta means spiritual friendship, as you both know, and particularly the kind of spiritual friends who've seen non-self and understand that there's nothing here except a conditioned process. Um, and because of that, it's so important that we're careful about the conditions that we create and that we expose ourselves to. So a big part of the project that I'm doing here, which is to establish a Bikini Vihara um, in the UK, is to create spiritual friendship so that people mm. are nourished um, with teachings and with examples of um, spiritual friends on this path. Because if we don't have that, we're going to carry on running and rolling according to our own habit patterns, precisely because there's no self. Um, and it's getting that peace, you know, getting that part of the, of the jigsaw really in place that can allow for the rest of the path to unfold properly. So... Thank you. And so on that note, with these last, this last year or two, I know that there has been, you know, speaking of dismantling the self or constructs, you've been constructing something new, <laughs> but doing it, but doing it with some Kalyanamitta in, in, in the, in the, the field. So what, what has, can you give us an outline of these last two years? Um, and where are you seated now? And what's that been like? And yeah. Yeah, so um, we started this project, I started this with my teacher Ajahn Brown, and uh, in a sense you could say it's all his fault, because I would never have come up with this idea on my own. The last thing I wanted to do was kind of uh, get the doer busy, you know, <laughs> and uh, start creating, as you say, something in samsara. And yet at the same time, being a bikini, it's very evident that there are so few places for women to practice. We do have to be concerned with putting those basic conditions in place. 
So for me, I guess the way that it's been spiritually helpful is to realize I'm not doing it for me. I'm not doing it from a sense of self, but I'm doing it more as an act of gratitude to my teacher, a service, you know, for everything that I've received, which is immense. And uh, also simply because it needs to be done. So, of course, I can't always maintain this perspective. And sometimes the little ego comes in and goes, oh, it's not fair. I'm tired. It's so much for one person. But um, over the years, gradually, gradually, we've been um, developing community. And in the last year, basically, we came to the point where the community was mature enough to actually put down an offer on a property, which is where we are right now. We're not in the shrine room, unfortunately, but we're <laughs> the uh, little study the place where lots of good karma is made and um so in november i moved in it's a, a four-bedroom terrace house in oxford it was a four-bedroom terrace house but now it's a vihara and it's really amazing how a place becomes what it's used for you know at first it feels like a house no different from the neighbor's house but now as soon as you walk in you feel oh this is a spiritual place it's a place of practice it's a place of peace and moreover, it's a place of friendship too. And uh, it's just beautiful to see that, you know, not only myself and Venerable Apeka sort of set the tone and try to obviously put some positive influence there for the people who come, but the people who come themselves are becoming friends to each other. And it seems that by observing one another's good examples, the whole kind of ethical conduct increases. So the mm. level of virtue just seems really strong at the moment, which is something very beautiful to witness. Mm. Um, so, yes, it's been a lot of hard work. I actually had a complete burnout, I think, last time we spoke, actually. Uh, uh, I think it was around there. I was either going through burnout or I don't know. I'm still recovering, I think, at the physical level. But I'm starting to feel myself nourished by the community, which is lovely. Mm. So it's not all give and receiving nothing back. It's actually a mutually beneficial thing. Thank you. Do, do you feel the the sort of difference between burnout and nourishing sustainable mode is is that community and in, in and in a place or is there what's the key ingredient for you? Hmm, good question. I guess it's a a combination of things over time. But certainly, if you don't actually have a place to live, if you don't have a place to rest, if you don't have nourishing food, how can you thrive? And this is why we're doing this. It's not that there were lots of options for me as a bhikkhuni. You know, I actually really had to struggle to keep my monastic life viable, as in to stay in robes. And the thought of ever leaving the robes for me is completely heartbreaking. Like, I wouldn't really see much purpose to my life. Of course, I could continue to practice to some extent. But once the renunciation has happened in the heart and manifested by, you know, actually taking the path of renunciation and being a fully ordained non, it's almost impossible for me to conceive of going back. So those very, very basic things are part of what's helping me recover my health. You know, the fact that it amazes me every day that we get a delicious, nutritious meal and that the guests are kind enough to even consider my special diet in terms of health concerns. And, and then, yeah, staying in the same place day after day. The ongoing mentorship for my teacher, Ajahn Brown, we speak every week mm. and he's there for me no matter what. You know, I can go through anything with him, whether it's spiritual stuff, mundane stuff, relational stuff. I'll tell him about it. He'll listen. Very rarely give concrete advice, but just be there to kind of hold the space and to give me a sense that he trusts me. You know, he trusts that there's nothing to worry about. And that keeps me going through some of the difficulties. And then I guess... Yeah, other things that have helped. I do feel that when we have guests here who are here through really pure intentions just to give and to see the Bikuni Sangha thrive mm -hmm. and to practice, um, it helps create a really strong holding space. So I also can start to relax and realize it's not just up to me to give. I can actually start to receive some of that nourishment of being around genuine practitioners as well. And of course, having Venerable Ipeka here has been like <laughs> a major thing, right? I didn't see another robe for like two and a half years while I was in the, the COVID pandemic. Mm. It's just, I mean, people say when they come, oh, it's great to see a bikini, but all I see are the lay people. I don't see other bikinis. <laughs> having, 
my dear friend who we ordained together in Perth as bikinis uh, some time ago. It's coming up to our 10th birthday as bikinis now. Oh, um, uh, it, it's been really wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just that friendship, that mutual support. And and actually that I suppose is um and Ajin Kobe that I'll give you the, the floor in a second, but um just to sort of uh touch on one of those things you brought up and also bring in Venerable Upeka as well. Um, I'm curious about both of your, you know, advice to a young woman interested in, or an old woman interested in ordaining. Um, what would, what would you tell them and, and how would they go forward? Yeah. I start, I guess. Well, um, now I know it makes a difference where you ordain and and who you who surrounds you when you ordain. So uh, yes, well, to begin with, you don't have to be perfect. <laughs> you don't have to have gotten your act together, got your meditation to down the levels, and and then ordain. That's what I, I thought I had to be before I ordained. So <laughs> you don't have to be perfect. Yet there is a certain time that it takes to for the mind to feel ready. Like when I was 23, actually when I was about 14, I remember seeing an ordination and going, oh my God, maybe I can do that. So there was a seed there, probably from a last life, past life. It takes time. It takes time. So from the age of 23 to 35, I first, I, I, I guess I was, uh, the, it, the, it had to mature the time to ordain and the place to ordain. But yet you have to keep it in your mind. You have to keep it in your mind and not sort of end up on another track. Uh, hang around with spirit, within monasteries, Hang around with nuns if you can. I see in our monastery, you know, g uh, women, I guess girls, to me, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> um, come in every year uh, for many, many years, and then sometimes they don't ordain. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that's the next step. So you, you, uh, you grow into it. You start with an ideal, but it takes time for the, for the heart to be ready. <laughs> but never give it up. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> That's, yes. Yeah. Venerable Chanda? Oh, okay. Well, um, yeah, I think to have, I mean, everything that Venerable Upeka says, I completely agree with, actually. Mm. The idea of allowing it to percolate and, and, you know, preparing the foundations, basically, um, allowing it to be a natural process because I think sometimes people come at it thinking well I should do this it makes sense you know ideologically I can understand the reason to ordain um, but a lot of the time you know it's a, a step too far too soon so I think establish a practice especially work on your foundation of virtue um, keep coming to monasteries spend time get to know what it actually is about and also visit different places because sometimes it's about a particular connection with a certain community or a certain teacher. Ideally, you wouldn't make, want to make it all about the teacher, but it has to be a place where you feel the wholesome qualities can increase. And um, understand as well that with the Bukuni Sangha at this stage, we need people who are willing to serve quite a lot because we don't have the kind of resources to just allow somebody to be in retreat mode all the time that's actually nothing to do with my monastic life in England anyway it has to be a combination of service and practice but the service can feed into the practice because you're developing really strong virtues virtue is not only about abstaining from things that are harmful it's about really bringing goodness into the world and um, kindness and selflessness sacrifice sometimes um so see that your practice is moving in a direction that's balanced you know it should be leading to a wish to serve others to help others and not only to gain certain elevated states i mean this is part and parcel of the path of course but they come at 
natural consequence of having the foundations in place and don't rush it don't push yourself at all sometimes you have to kind of go through some of the things in the world I mean ideally you want to see the danger and move away from them before you suffer too much but sometimes we actually have to experience why things are uh, unsatisfactory in the end and conduce to suffering so it doesn't work if you push yourself it'll come back to bite you later on mm. so just let it gradually unfold and work on your practice the whole eightfold purpose thank you Ajahn Kovilo yeah I guess I'm, I'm curious to maybe uh, thread a few of the different strands that we're talking about um, just in general um, we've got this idea this concept of samana sanya the perception of oneself as being a, a renunciant which I know has been really important in my own monastic life, but it can be a bit strange for um, someone who's not familiar with this idea. Um, you know, both of the venerables have been talking about life as a bhikkhuni, and to some extent, we're all taking on this perception that we are renunciants, but at the same time, as Venerable Pekka, you mentioned, you know, at the same time, we're deeply trying to learn and lean into this truth of not self. Um, and as you said, Venerable Chanda, um, we're also trying to give our lives in service. And um, I'm curious, Venerable Upeka, if you can speak about the relationship between uh, being deeply committed to a form, the bhikkhuni form, the samana renunciate form, and the truth of not self. And then Venerable Chanda, if you'd be willing to speak to the relationship between service and being a samana. Uh, if there is a, a relationship you can speak to. Mm. Yeah, gosh. <laughs> well, the non-self non is the culmination of, of the Samana life, but we still need the form and need to um, identify with the form in order to, to go towards that understanding of non-self. So it's kind of like associating with the associating with the wise to associate with the samana form. And admittedly it's difficult because we have been in Sansara for so long and the minds, my mind anyway, constantly re remembers the 35 years before I ordained and, and not the 15 years since I ordained. Uh, but to surround yourselves with samanas and to surround yourself with true samanas, which you don't always come across. You come across with people dressed in robes most of the time. <laughs> well, when you're like our communities are 15, 15, I don't know, around, most of them are junior nuns. So they just be, behave like normal people, you know. They are not monastics for long term. That's part of the difficulty of the bhikkhuni sasana that we don't have summoners of long standing we have a whole bunch of young girls dressed in brown robes <laughs> for the most part yeah I, but when i do see a true summoner someone who has been in robes a long time mature in their practice something in the mind shifts you go there is something different and that wakes it up in me. Um, I have to say, I do struggle with Samana Sanya because, um, because, because of the, the, Jew, the, the sort of the immaturity of the bhikkhuni sangha. There are no mature bhikkhunis to, to, um, to, to see, to visualize. So I don't know if I'm answering the question, but... Anyway, Samana Sanya is, it, 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 it imprints something in your head. You see it in reality, you know, you see it in the, the, the brown robe and you go, something emotional, something emotional uh, works inside. Yeah, wow. something inside is awakened. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Venable. Yeah. Yeah. So you're asking me about um, samana, being a samana and also the role of service. Is that right? Right, right. yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess 
for me, the Dhamma has always been about service. Like the whole purpose to me is sort of to remove as far as possible these aspects of greed, hate and delusion, not only from my heart, but from the world, right? And I remember when I was a teenager, just feeling so despairing, you know, just seeing the news was kind of enough to awake this sense of a search for a path in me because I saw the way that people, you know, go to war on each other <laughs> based basically on power and greed, right? And it just seemed to me that that wouldn't happen if people were at peace within themselves, you know, and that if anyone has greed in their heart, it, it's it's going to turn that way. It's going to turn to destruction, to, you know, uh, power trips and wars and all the rest. So, um, I think already through the practice, anybody who practices is already doing a great favor for the world. It's a service, you know, because you're making yourself a harmless person. So this is obviously refined further with the monastic training because the uh, the training rules we undertake are really to restrain any elements within ourselves that can cause harm for others um, to a really great degree. And I think for me, the more interesting training rules are not so much about not eating in the evening or kind of looking a certain way or becoming a non. I think that's something to be wary of with this idea of non-self. You know, you can just take yourself and try to spiritualize it. You know, I don't like my old self, I'll get a new self and it'll be a non. <laughs> so I always say renouncing or ordaining rather than becoming a non or being a bikini. It's just language, but it does help. But um, yeah, part of the training is restraining ourselves from creating harm. So the, the things that I find interesting are things around uh, right speech very much. And also um, having an attitude of respect. You know, there's one particular, I think, that says uh, an offence of disrespect is to be confessed. And these sort of things are very subtle and often things that aren't really brought out in the Patimoka or, you know, in, in our meetings or, monthly, or fortnightly meetings. Um, but this is really refined virtue. And I guess just asking ourselves, what can we give? And... How can we give in a way that doesn't deplete us, but that actually resources our own practice as well? So, of course, for monastics, we tend to give the Dhamma. We share the Dhamma as far as possible. Um, in my particular situation, I'm also trying to create spaces for other monastics and spaces for people to practice, as you both are as well. And I think part of the service there is to offer a spiritual community to others. Um, part of it is also to repay my debt of gratitude to my teachers first and foremost, but also my family, because through do doing this project, I've been able to bring them in contact with true summoners, you know, people I have confidence in as really highly developed uh, beings, you could say. Um, and they're having this kind of contact and saying, wow, you know, there's something to this. It seems to create people who are bright and who are respectful and who are kind of easy to talk to and, deeply virtuous, trustworthy. So I think these are all the kind of qualities with which we serve the world. I mean, who doesn't want to be around somebody who they can trust and who they feel safe around? You know, that's one of the biggest forms of suffering for beings. We can't trust each other. We feel disconnected. So I think that's one of the gifts we can bring as summoners. I, actually, that's the defining quality, really, that we should be highly virtuous, highly ethical beings. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you both. Um... Yeah, a lot to look into there and something which, yeah, outside of people who are in these robed forms, it, uh, mm. yeah, who else is talking about this Samana, um, mm. Samana Sanya? And uh, I'm curious if uh, you both have talked about a true Samana or a true renunciate and also this kind of beautiful um, phrase which uh, Venerable Chandra, you used, um, someone who's realized the truth of not self, um, you know, that in my mind, I, I'm not so familiar with that phrase, but it strikes me as someone as referring to and pointing to this aspect of, um, mm -hmm. yeah, of, of attainment. And I'm curious if both of you could speak about your relationships with, uh, with teachers who you've had. I know, uh, Ayo Peko, you've stayed at the Mahasi Center. You've both stayed around really well-trained um, bhikkhus and bhikkhunis uh, in Australia and elsewhere. Venerable Chanda, you've I studied in Burma, Nepal, India. You both have invited Aya Ananda Bodhi to come and teach. And um, yeah, just talk about your relationships with um, 
yeah, people who you feel are uh, good role models, good samana role models, mm-hmm. and good models of this realization or deeper insights into mm-hmm. not self. <laughs> my favorite <laughs> subject, <Your> favorite subject. <laughs> i'll cry if i talk about this because I, I have a very deep sense of devotion toward the area sangha yeah and i think in my life i do feel fortunate to have the confidence that i've met some of these people that it is possible for human beings and i think in the beginning because i trained in asia um my first teacher was goenkaji but of course he sort of spawned this massive movement all over the world where there were many, many centers, I think 400 or something in the world. And you didn't have a lot of contact with him directly, but I did have some. And I already, it was enough to know that somebody who's further on the path is never intimidating. They're actually deeply compassionate and easy to be around. And I felt that I could sit in their presence and ask them anything. And this is already very, very helpful on the path, right? That there's people in this world that don't judge you, that have compassion for you, that just want your benefit. You know, they only have your best benefit at heart. And um, that was already enormous for me. And also that Goenkaji never wanted to make himself the teacher or the guru in any way. So that was actually um, uh, very much emphasised in that tradition that we were our own kind of... um, teachers in a sense we had to walk on the path the teachers could only guide us but in the end we had to come to the understandings ourselves. and I think Goenka never made any claims of being a a stream winner but he clearly had very very strong qualities and also that sense of selfless service and very deep meditation so he'd talk about sort of people this wasn't really known but it was known among the close circles because I was in Asia around a lot of people who trained with him directly And he would talk about people coming to the centers and some have beings with them, kind of guardian protectors who'd wait for them outside. Some others would bring them in and things like this, you know. And there was just this sense of someone completely committed to the Dhamma. And then uh, my next teacher was my Sayadaw in Burma, Sayadaw Upanyajata. And he was reputed to have attained incredibly deep insight, which was very obvious just by (laughs) meeting him. one of the defining characteristics that seems common among all the people I have confidence in as having seen non-self, seen through the delusion of a self, is that they did have very, very deep samadhi meditation. And he had that from a very young age, from 16. And he'd sit down and meditate for three days at a stretch, you know, completely like a rock without going to the toilet or anything like that and have all these kind of... Uh, yeah, I suppose I shouldn't say too much because I mentioned his name. <laughs> but uh, this is the way the uh, the understanding goes. And um, people never actually tell you directly, but you kind of hear this from, from supporters and you have to have a bit of faith. And with him too, it just felt like this outpouring of metta. It was almost as though having a person's presence like that to meditate with would bring you up to a... a already a higher place than you were before so you'd be starting from a different kind of starting point if you like and um and that was very powerful um and then with my teacher Ajahn Brahm and I'm aware that I'm speaking only about monks so far and men but I will talk about some women as well um with my teacher Ajahn Brahm it was another uh level of accessibility because he's also a West, a British-born Buddhist monk. And at first I had prejudice about that. I was like, I don't want to listen to these like Western monks. They don't know the real thing, you know. They're not Asian. They've not been brought up in it. So I was kind of like, yeah, pretty dismissive. But as soon as I heard um, talks from him uh, that he gives to the monks, so these are the deep deep talks that are just being made available for anyone interested on Deeper Dhamma podcast, BSWA. Uh I just had PT coursing through my body and mind and I knew this is the real thing, you know, this is someone who's realised these things and um, and perhaps the fact that he had a similar background and could speak to some of the Western sort of psychological knots that we have um, to our conditioning basically was uh, was just so accessible and so instant in, in terms of a teaching. Um, and I think, I guess the main thing about associating with people like this is that 
having seen non-self for themselves, they see that, that in everybody. So they don't define you. They don't fix you. They don't judge you. And it's an incredibly different feeling from being with most people. It's almost like there's nothing you could do that would make them lose face, <laughs> almost, probably nothing, because they would still see your own capacity for awakening because they've seen their own. They know, they don't just believe, they know that everybody has that same potential. And that is relayed to you again and again and again. So the level of confidence that that gives me is immense. Um, I sometimes, of course, because of self-view, think, oh, but not me, you know. <laughs> but then whenever you meet these people, you kind of know that it is possible and it's just a matter of the causes and conditions coming together. And then, of course, there have been really wonderful female practitioners. And I have met a couple who I suspect are fairly far on the path. One is um, a Burmese nun, Sayali Dipankara. And another is actually a lay woman. I really like Charlotte Catherine. I think she's pretty exceptional. Uh, she has some qualities that are really admirable from my perspective, because I tend to be like particularly, uh, I mean, I have a lot of kindness and compassion, but it can be kind of, there can be a danger of being too emotionally engaged with people. But she has this very cool kindness that's very bounded and this ability to say no, which I find like, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> this is someone who's beyond caring what people think and is just um, very, very clear in herself. So I, I think her wisdom and discernment qualities are very strong. Um, yeah. And then other bikinis as well. You mentioned Ayur Ananda Bodhi. She's someone I certainly respect. Um, and she's been a good support to, to me as a friend and also as an advisor to the project because she's done many of the same things I'm trying to do. So she has a great understanding um, and ability to kind of uh, understand how things are for bhikkhunis, which is really refreshing and something not that monks, even Ajahn Brown, can't always do. So I don't know if that really answers the question. <laughs> but, yeah, for me, I guess the Sangha as a refuge is a really important refuge. Sometimes I think it's more visceral even than the Buddha himself, although I'm getting much closer to the Buddha through the suttas these days. But actually seeing a living, breathing example and embodiment of the Dhamma is incredibly powerful. And just to finish with a caveat that don't presume, <laughs> don't kind of come quickly to any judgment of a person's stages on the path. They won't actually tell you most of the time. So suss them out over years. And when you do, and when you feel that confidence, it can be really a very beautiful thing. Yeah. <laughs> I just talked about particular people, but I don't know. You met Ajahn Bayan where you were close to her. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But I did, I, I didn't know her so well. I didn't know her so well uh, because she was ill shortly mm. after I joined the monastery. Um, and she changed, you know, a, a lot in that 20 years that she was ill. Um, anyway, um, uh, I I would say that uh, the sight of an aria, if you have the potential to see it, that's the other thing, you know. <laughs> like you can come across these beings. I, I met um, going to G as well when I was like twenty two or something like that. He looked cool, but there was no, you know, like wow about it. So one has had. But I feel it is also your own quietness of mind that is able to resonate with the pers these these beings. It's not just them; it's actually mostly you, your uh, your uh, your attunement, your quietness, your samadhi that recognizes that is able to recognize. Anyway, that's how, mm. that's that's how I find it. Uh, that said, that said, it makes all the difference because, um, like, being born in Sri Lanka in the seventies, we were the the paradigm was there are no more arahants left in the world. <laughs> Too bad. Good luck. Hope to be born in the time of Maitreya Buddha. If not, that's it. We're stuffed, kind of thing. <laughs> um, and that has that really isn't the case anymore that isn't the case anymore I feel 
like I've almost, you know, so privileged to be born in this time because mm -hmm. really in Sri Lanka for the last few hundred years, the maybe there were monks in the forest that nobody knew of, but or nuns. Or nuns, perhaps, perhaps, yeah, that nobody knew of. Uh, but in Sri Lanka anyway, in the last it's only really in the last 20 years that there have been really good teachers, young teachers who who um, who you know maybe they've they've gotten somewhere. You have your friend. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. I have a very I can't talk to a very beautiful Sri Lankan nun. She speaks some English now, but mostly in Sinhala. Um who glows. I mean I don't know what she is, but she she's just generally radiant at all times, however busy she is. Uh, she's how old? I think she's 33. <laughs> Very young. I think we're born in fortunate times, so we have to make use of it. These opportunities don't come very easily in, in Sansara to be close to the Dhamma, to be close to the Arya Sangha. So mm -hmm. it's a very special time. And uh, yeah. 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 <sighs> Thank you, both of you. And um... I'm like quite inspiring words and I'm, you know, speaking about moving towards or from these images of transcendence uh, mm -hmm. to how you keep that in mm -hmm. what you're doing right now. And, and you spoke about the challenges that have come with living this bhikkhuni life and also creating a space and the whole Anukampa bhikkhuni project. So I, I wondered if you might, um, I know we're coming to the, closer to the end of our time together, but would you lay out for our community a little bit what you've been involved with and, and what that's looked like, what you've been working with in terms of creating this space in, in the UK? Yeah, thanks. Um, as I said, it can be very challenging and yet I think it's a beautiful interview actually because it's connecting me with these sort of superpower forces that are behind it. You know, it's not only coming from me. In fact, if it was coming from me, I'd it wouldn't work, right? And I would be dead, I think. <laughs> Honestly, I don't think there's any way I would survive. But because I made a promise to my first teacher, from the moment he met me, before he even ordained me, he said, if you ordain, is it for life? And I said, yes. It wasn't that he asked me to do it for life, but it was just a spontaneous response. And knowing that, that come, that's that's a question I answered honestly in the presence of someone I so deeply respect. You know, and also having Ajahn Brahm support with me this whole way through, very strong support. Um, it just gives it another dimension and makes something like this possible. The other thing that makes it possible is that I take time every year for at least a three month retreat, usually four months. And that time is completely offline as far as it's humanly possible. Usually it works. And I'm in the forest and I'm meditating on my own with a community that I love around me, a community that understand solitude, uh, that are there for me if I need anything but won't kind of intrude. Um, and I just feel so at home with them. So this is also one really important aspect of um, making this work in the UK. It has to come from practice. It has to come from a genuine intention to serve and to be very wary of um, having too many goals, I guess, because in the beginning, I think there was this sense of me wanting to please my teacher by doing something fast and big. And over the years, I've been trying to convey that it isn't about size. It's not going to be big because it's about community. It's not about place. So I've been really adamantly sort of um trying to make that the priority trying to bring the people together and the place as a result of of a community rather than the other way around and i think that's helped a lot so that now we have a place it's actually being filled with the right people people that i've already known through the zoom sessions that we've been doing especially during the corona pandemic that was a massive boost for us as a community so not only do they know me they know each other and we've been practicing together for at least three years, you know, remotely, but now in person again. So um, 
Yeah, it's difficult and certainly I need a lot more help because one of the things about this project is that I wasn't invited by an established group. There was no trust, there were no supporters, there were no even friends here in the UK except my childhood friend and my family because I'd lived in Asia literally all my adult life. So, and then Australia for three or four years. So we really started this from scratch. And because of that, I'm kind of heading every aspect of it and managing all the volunteers, managing the trust, managing all the events, the website, the YouTube channel. Actually, I have a YouTube volunteer who's brilliant. Um, we have some really committed volunteers, but the management side needs to shift um, because in order for something to really be sustainable in the long term, the monastics need to feel they're developing on their paths. So some of the time it's treading water, but some of the time it seems like it's treading water. But behind that, there's a lot of qualities being developed. There are a lot of edges that I'm meeting and uh, places where I have to just say I'm struggling. You know, I've learned that you have to be vulnerable because to sort of pretend like you've got it together all the time would be a killer. So I'm just open. And sometimes I might come downstairs. I think we've both done this, even while you've been here. We've come downstairs. We've been a bit kind of down. And we've had a few tears, right, in full public view because there's no choice. And so we just say to the guests, yeah, you know, I'm struggling today. I'm feeling sad or I'm feeling anxious. And that actually creates a really strong sense of camaraderie. And people have told me it's very inspiring because then we feel accepted the way we are as well. So I think, um, I don't know if that really answers, that's just a flow of thoughts that with no particular order to it. But um, yeah, just some kind of glimpses into how things are going. <laughs> and it's, I guess it's because I really don't know what, what, what I'm doing, right? I mean, it's not like I've practiced doing this <laughs> earlier in my life or probably not even in previous lives. I probably had the conditions just there. Or I was probably in India, so <laughs> didn't need them. <laughs> so it's really sometimes like taking half a footstep or just putting your toe in front of the next. And sometimes it's just standing steady and kind of recovering from the wobble, but just staying with it and trusting the path. Mm. Yeah, but it'd be nice if you had any more closing reflections on your time here and what you've seen happening, maybe. Or, uh, or, or the question that was originally put. I'm not sure. I can't remember what the I can't question <laughs> What was the question? Don't know. Just talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this is this is for uh, I've I've sort of been uh, at uh, uh, Venerable Chanda's friend now since we met, and listening to her life unfold over the last seven years. We talk regularly. We've been talking regularly on Skype, and I think this is a. a a key moment. It's like a time that the project has shifted from herself trying to just simply stay alive <laughs> to many conditions coming together. And there's a place, there's a roof fully paid for, mortgage free house. There's people who come to offer, to come to stay regularly. There's very rarely that there's no guest. All the guests who are come are extremely you know uh, 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 how would you say respectful understand the sangha they're not like you know we're just here to have a holiday kind of a thing they're under yeah they understand how monasteries work i don't know they all seem to know what to do <laughs> <laughs> and also i'm here so it's not like it's not one person it's like and it's we are a body we are representing the Sangha, we are, it's not Venerable Chanda show, it's, this is the Sangha here. So um, I think it, it's, it's like it's turned, turned a page and, it's, and we have found out that is the natural progression of any, organ, any, any organization. It starts with one person and then now it has to go to yeah. the, the responsibility is moving away from one person to now a group of people. And that's where it's at, mm, where mm. she's, she, the people are coming forward to be able to make that next step. So it's, it's a, it's a definitely, yeah. definitely something's going on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And just to say as well, just to express my gratitude to you 
for me. being such a wonderful Kalyanamita and actually, you. you know, yeah. taking the leap to come over because mm -hmm. it's not easy. Not only setting up is not easy, but actually coming away from a very comfortable, very well supported place to the unknown also takes a leap of faith and, mm -hmm. and you were the one that did it and mm -hmm. it has made a big difference having you here although mm -hmm. she is going back in uh, less than a month um, and I'm also going on retreat but I think you know it's almost like everybody who comes here leaves their mark and, and increases the the richness of what we have to offer it's like everybody contributes something and changes the atmosphere here mm -hmm. for the long term and I'm sure you'll be back Come back. Sure. <laughs> Venerable, thank you so much for taking the time. I think you ha might have to go somewhat soon, but um, yeah, is there any way that um, we'll put a link to the Anakampa Bikuni project um, in the show notes, but is there anywhere else that people could support, support the project and maybe come to meet you or receive more teaching? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So we have, um, we still have some Zoom sessions because it was such an important, indispensable part of our development. So we still have um, every Friday evening, which I think works for America. Um, it'll be your morning time, um, a sort of discussion. So we go through um, the social and communal harmony uh, anthology by Bhikkhu Bodhi and uh, bring that to life you know everybody shares their own insights or their own struggles in daily life related to the sutta that we read and we also do meta meditation we also have dhamma talks by different bhikkhunis and of course Ajahn Brahmali and other teachers who are very closely associated with our project so that's on our Anukampo Bhikkhuni project YouTube channel and also in our newsletters and on our website you can find the links or at least a link to the links for the Zoom sessions. And um, our address is not public simply because I'm the only Bikuni most of the time living here. So, and also to preserve the solitude, but you can write to team at anukampaproject.org to ask for information about coming to visit, coming to stay as a guest. We've had some, Amer we have one American lady here now and we've had your very own Grace stay with us for seven weeks. Uh, all the way from Washington State. So people can come and stay and experience the monastic lifestyle firsthand to support their own Dharma practice of the whole path. And they can also, if they're from England, most likely they can offer dana. They can come at lunchtime. But you can also offer dana remotely. So again, writing to the team at just team at Um You can write to them and send a meal basically contact some sort of local organization food place here and they'll send a meal to our doorstep so that way everyone gets the opportunity to partake in offering dana to the sangha and yeah Ajahn Brahm is coming to England in November so he has a couple of mini retreats and lots of public talks so you can apply for those anything else and volunteers volunteers I mean as Venerable Pekka said I am in the process of trying to delegate significant parts of my work, especially events management, which is about 50% of what I do, <laughs> maybe. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, what we really need are volunteers who can contribute significant amounts of time rather than an hour a week or something, because these are big jobs. But um, just stay in touch with us through the newsletter and, and write in to, to ask how you can be involved. I um, really want to just say how beautiful it is to see what you both are doing there. And I know it hasn't been an easy kind of movement through all that. Um, but I hope that, you know, in terms of treading water, swimming, there's water wings coming. And, you know, from the other side of the, the Atlantic, it's just really a pleasure to actually speak with you both. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, both of you. It's lovely to meet you. And, and it's wonderful to have supportive monk allies really wonderful because this has to happen right i mean it's going to be the calling in all human beings hearts to renounce fully and to take up the training offered by the buddha for generations to come so we have to make that possible so thank you both for being part of that as well mm -hmm. and i wish you every success in mm -hmm. your own uh, project your own monastery over there yeah and thank you for the great questions yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> brilliant look forward to meeting you in person Someday. Yay! Yeah. Hope so. Hope so.